Hi. In this video, I will be attempting to solve the five day three puzzles from the 2017 Galactic Puzzle Hunt. There is obviously a spoiler alert for all of these puzzles as the answers will be revealed. Check the video description for links to the puzzles, links to the day one and day two solving videos, and timestamps for specific puzzles in this video if you want to skip around. So as I said in the day two video, the team behind the Galactic Puzzle Hunt, uh, Galactic Trendsetters, is in charge of the 2021 MIT Mystery Hunt coming up in January. And since I recorded the day two video, it was announced that you know, because of all the travel restrictions and everything, the 2021 mystery hunt will be all remote. I, I don't know if other people were hoping that some form of it would happen on campus or if some people were hoping it would be delayed, but this is definitely the outcome I was hoping for. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. And like I said before, I'm hoping that this galactic puzzle hunt will be sort of a preview of what the mystery hunt this year is going to be like. And I think that's especially true uh, now that it's all online because the uh, galactic puzzle hunt was all online. Okay, let's get started. Day three, puzzle one, puncturing sensation. Ooh, a very short one. All right, seems pretty straightforward at first. Let's just get some answers for these. The idea of puncturing makes me think of putting letters inside other letters or taking them out. Uh, and also I noticed that this is punctuation. If you take out these middle eight letters, Oxford comma is a thing. I'm thinking of different kinds of punctuations that could relate to these. Air quotes. And this one, contains quotes. Oh, no, it's not a kind of punctuation, but grace period is a thing. All right, so comma only appears in one. Quotes only appears in one. Period only appears in one. Okay, so look, only this last one has a period on it. Oh, defensive semicolon is a thing in programming. Okay. So that just leaves hyphen and exclamation point. Swung dash. All right, so swung dash is a thing. Big exclamation. There's got to be another word for that. Oh, bang. Okay, big bang. All right, nice. So we're definitely on the right track. Okay, so this first one has a comma, so let's put the answer that corresponds to comma here. Okay, so still stuck at this point after about two more hours looking at it. One thing that makes this very perplexing is that I feel like I've used all of the given information. There doesn't seem to be anywhere else to pull any information from. Two minor exceptions are, first, that these blanks are right justified instead of normally it would just be an enumeration, or if there was blanks, it would be centered or left justified. That makes me think we should look at the end of the answers. And the other minor thing is that there are many ways they could have clued punctuation in the title, and they went with this one with some letters in between making up more complete words. I was looking for any way that we could apply that to the letters that are being pulled out here. 
So if you take the punctuation symbols in the order they appear, comma, semicolon, exclamation point, bang, and sort by that, and then take their last letters, A-N-G-H-E-D, then it is possible to insert a punctuation mark into it that forms a series of words. If you put ellipsis in, it spells angel lips I shed. So that I'm pretty sure is nothing. Okay, I have been stuck for over four hours now. It's time to request one of these yes or no hints. So I wrote up the answers and the corresponding punctuation marks that I got, and I said which clue each punctuation appears in. And so the yes or no question I'm asking is basically, is this all I need to solve the rest of the puzzle? It's yes if I can get the answer out of this, and it's no if I need to either use the clue or some other external resource. Okay. So go ahead and send it and stop the timer while waiting for a response. Uh, before, they've been pretty quick with the response, so I'll check back soon. All right. Let's see what we got. Hmm. The answer to your question is no. Okay, so let's go over exactly what that means. So either one or more of these is wrong. That was a possibility. Or there's some more information in the clue that I need to pull out, or there's some information somewhere else on the web. Maybe all these words appeared together in some document somewhere, and I would need to look that up. And of course, I also need to keep in mind the possibility that I misinterpreted their response. But definitely, I think the most likely avenue is that there's something else in the clue to pull out. So let's try that for a while, and if that doesn't work, we'll look more broadly. So one trick that's often useful is to get into the mind of the person creating the puzzle and seeing constraints that they have and did what they create make sense with those constraints? Or does it seem like there's something else that they had to satisfy? So like for this clue, their constraints were they had to do something that clued to swung and it had to have a comma. I couldn't have any other punctuation. And this seems pretty much like what you would have to do. Like if you just had a clue swung, I would say, why is there two parts? Why wouldn't you just say move like a pendulum? But because they had to incorporate a comma, it makes sense that they would have had to add both parts. And both of them are pretty straightforward. I'd say that's true for these first three. By contrast, the last three don't seem as straightforward. For instance, this one, you had to clue something that had a solution of grace, and it had to have a period, and no other punctuation. And it seems like you could just do a more straightforward clue for grace. For instance, a ballet dancer trait. Seeing this, you have to think there's some reason that you know they couldn't just do something very simple. One possibility is, of course, you know whoever wrote this puzzle really likes that album, and they wanted to use it as a clue. So I'm not sure, kind of half and half. Yeah, so I'm still stuck, even with that hint. It definitely seems to me like the most likely reason that the answer was no is because there's something more I need to extract from the clues. But there is still a possibility that I have a mistake in my answers. It seems unlikely, but I think that with this yes or no hint system that you really need to be sure of your base assumptions in order to get good information out of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and use a hint on that. I'm just going to list my answers here and say, is this correct? Okay, going to stop for the night and I'll pick this up another day. All right, let's resume. Yes. So all these answers are correct, assuming I understand the response right. So definitely that's the outcome I expected, but now I can continue knowing that's the case. Ah, my browser just crashed. I had to restart the clock. It's about eight and a half hours behind. I'll work out the exact time when I finish. All right, still no luck over nine hours in. So I think I will call in a third hint. And if that doesn't get me there, then I will give up. I was trying to decide how many hints would be appropriate to ask for. Three might be pushing it. It says that every day the team will receive two hints. Using three hints on a single puzzle is kind of a lot. Yeah, it's very hard to think of a question I could ask that would really help me one way or the other. So I'm just going to try to confirm my largest suspicion, which is that everything I need is here on the page. So let's see what they say. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and resume. It's been 22 hours since I last wrote and I haven't heard back yet. Okay, so including the eight and a half hours from earlier, I think we are over 12 hours now. And according to the protocol, you may quit after 12 hours. 
I don't think there's any point dragging this out any longer. I've been stuck since 30 minutes in, so I think it just makes sense to stop here. Okay, so the total time spent solving was 12 hours, 11 minutes, and 20 seconds over three days. So now we should look up the answer, but I think what I'd like to do is to try to read just enough of the solution to get unstuck and then see where that takes me. Solution, and I'm going to make the window as small as possible here. Okay, we solved the six clues. Okay. So they have here associated words with each punctuation mark. There's definitely multiple ways you could define what the associated words are with a piece of punctuation. Oh, okay. All right, then this spells a clue here. Sports star who hit Grand Slam single. So this is the answer to the clue. Uh, we could try either Robin Ventura or just Ventura. Okay, cool. Cool, yeah, that just took a few minutes just from the idea of there being associated words. Okay, Puncturing Sensation by Rahul Sridhar. I thought this was a really great idea and a really impressive construction now that I realize the constraints that they were under uh, making the clues. thought that was really well done. So obviously the issue for me was that this associated words idea, it's definitely not something you see in puzzles very often. And it's not like ambiguous, but it's maybe a little more loose than what you usually see. Thinking about lessons for next time, I guess maybe try to consider extractions even if I'm worried they might not be 100% unambiguous. As soon as I tried this one, it came out re really easily. I think this puzzle did a really good job of not having any extraneous information. I don't know if they looked at my email asking for that last hint, but I can see it would have been very difficult to give a good answer because you don't need any external resource in order to extract the final clue, but you very well could need an external resource in order to answer the final clue. Let's go ahead and thank them and let them know that I won't be needing this hint after all. Yeah, this message just came as I was typing a response to them. Okay. All right, so they answered yes, which I think that's the right choice. But like I said, it was very ambiguous. So, so I'll just send a final thank you to them. Won't be asking them any more questions about this puzzle. Oh, you know, as I look at this, they responded right, right away yesterday. I don't know why this didn't show up in my inbox until just now. Doesn't make any difference. I think that this answer would have unsuck me. I do want to say, if you are solving puzzles years after the fact, like I am in this case, the puzzle creators may or may not be available to give you hints. It's always nice when they can, and often they can, but I wouldn't expect it. I will say that this puzzle solution really highlights the main thing I would be worried about, trying to do this on a live stream or something like that. Nobody wants to watch me stare at a spreadsheet for 12 hours and make no progress. So definitely off to a pretty slow start, but we've got four more puzzles to go. Okay, day three, puzzle two television. Oh boy. Okay, this is one big image. You can't interact with this at all. So it looks like we've got 15 images here and 15 sections of music. I don't recognize a single one of these images, but something tells me that they are from music videos. Let's start by figuring out a way to listen to these selections of music. All right, so doing a search by image for this first one, looks like it comes up with the right thing. I'm not sure what this article is saying. Translate from Turkish to English. Okay. Goals looks like a match. 2016 Eurovision Song 
contest. Cool, that worked pretty well. Let's try another one. Don't think any of these match. Let's try to get at least two. Maybe we can see a pattern, like maybe they're all from Eurovision or they were all released in 2016 or something like that. Oh, here we go. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah, that's the same. Great. Okay, I was able to identify six of the 15 images using a reverse image search and they were all 2016 Eurovision music videos. So I think it's probably going to be pretty easy to identify the rest. Let's take a look at this at the music, then we'll come back to identifying the rest of the images. Never used a program like this before. It seems pretty easy so far. All right, that looks right for this first one. There is an accent on one of the notes that I didn't put in. I suspect that that's part of the puzzle, because it looks like there is exactly one accent from each of these musical sections. Oh, very small eight means the notes should sound one octave lower than they are written. There we go. Let's see how this sounds. Okay, some musical selection. I definitely don't recognize it, but I didn't really expect to. All right, that looks right for the second one here. So hopefully these will be recognizable segments either from the song that the music video was for or maybe that country's national anthem. So I'll have to be comparing a lot of music, which is definitely not something I'm very good at, but uh, hopefully good enough to finish this puzzle. Okay, it was not too hard putting all these in, um, but I certainly don't recognize any of them. Seems like a good place to start is to listen to these songs and see if I can match them up with any of the any of the musical selections on here. All right, so I thought what made the most sense is to find the spot in the music video that corresponds to the image in the puzzle, and listen to the lyrics around that point. <laughs> Turkish, okay. But it sounds like it might match up with this track 10 here. All right, cool. So the notes cut off in the middle of this word. All right, so the accent is on this note here. So it looks like this is the syllable that the accent is on. Looks like it's in the right spot in the video, and it sounds sort of like this, but I'm really not very good at this. What do you think? Alright, we'll, we'll put it down for now. Alright, here's another one that seems to work, track three. I think that's a good enough match. I do notice that it's not the exact same place that this frame comes from for the image. That occurs just a little bit later. So it looks like the musical segment is not from wherever this image is. But I do notice in this case, this is the clearest part of the chorus. So maybe I should pay attention to whatever the most, most distinctive part of the song is. Okay, and then track three, it's the second note that is accented corresponding to is. All right. Okay. All right, so f we've only found three so far, but there is a pretty distinctive pattern, which I'm hopeful about. Okay, so this first one is the song 1944. The singer is from Ukraine. The track 10 is this one, or five, six, seven notes. 
and seven letters in Ukraine. Italy corresponded to track 15, and track 15 has one, two, three, four, five notes. So you count the, uh, the bridge notes as a single one. And track three was Germany, like seven notes here. Germany has seven letters. Okay, so this is going to help a lot. So I find an image of some singer that I haven't recognized yet. I look up the uh, images of the Eurovision contestants for 2016, figure out what country this person's from, and that will eliminate all but a couple of these, because I need one that has the same number of notes as this singer's country has. So that is just a couple tracks that I'll have to match up, so that should be much easier. Oh man, this is harder than I expected. <laughs> I'm not any good at this. New approach. I'm going to watch all the videos real quick and figure out which image each video corresponds to, if any. It's like 43 songs. No problem. Fortunately, you can always just play at double speed. Oh, yeah, okay, that's it. I think we decided it doesn't help to figure out the exact timestamp. As soon as I identify it, I'm just going to move on. Dami Im Australia. Oh, there we go. Number 13. Yeah, definitely. Or Tesoro, Belgium. Yeah, okay. All right, number nine. I think this is number five. Yeah. All right, two more to go. Number 10 and number 12. Cool. All right, that's number 10. This guy looks pretty distinctive. It shouldn't be too hard. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, great. So that is all of the images identified. I think we are done with the image sheet for now. Italy is the only one with five letters. We already identified that one. The only other unique one is eight letters for Bulgaria. So let's see if this works out. All right, here we go. There's one with eight notes. It's number two. Now let's compare that with the song for Bulgaria. Yeah, I'm obviously not very good at this. I can't really tell. Let's try another one. Um, so it looks like there's five sixes and six sevens and only two nines. So that might be an easier place to start. All right, so I went through for each of these and counted the notes in each one and made a note of which one was accented. Like in the first one, there are six notes and the fifth one is accented. All right, so I just sorted the country lengths and the music clip lengths. Okay, and these match up. It also confirms that these countries are probably right. So we can take the songs for Lithuania and Australia and compare them to the two tracks that have a length of nine. See which is which. Yep, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, I don't hear this one. Oh, 
Okay, no, actually I do hear it. Okay, yep. All right, so I put some formulas into these cells, and then this column will tell you which layer to extract from the country name. So for instance, in the first one, track 10 had seven notes, which corresponds to seven layers in Ukraine. The sixth one was accented, so we extract the N. And so as I go along, hopefully these will fill out and spell something. Five sixes and six sevens, so let's do the sixes next. All right, I've gone through all of the six note sequences, and I was able to get a few of them but the extraction is looking really good so far. I have a pretty strong suspicion as to what it is. If I was doing this during the actual competition, I would try to guess what the tracks are and see if I could get this to spell number one single. But for this video, I'm gonna to try to do things the right way. So let's move on to the seven note ones. I've identified a track for each of the songs, but seven of them, I'm not completely sure about. Sort of went based on whether it sort of fit the song overall. I wasn't able to match up exactly which lyric it was, but so these should be considered educated guesses, I guess. And so it does in fact spell out number one single. So that seems like a likely candidate for the answer. Let's try it out. All right, great. Okay. Television by Leonard Janson. I had a lot of fun with this one. Like I said, it's always cool when you can use a puzzle to introduce your hobby to other people. And as the author notes in this case, Eurovision is not very popular in the United States. So this puzzle was a lot of work for me. It was about four hours of uninterrupted working on it. But although there was a lot to do, it didn't really tax my lateral thinking very much. It was more straightforward work. And by the time I had finished, working out one step, but I'd already seen the pattern, so I knew what to do next. So there's no point where I was really stuck. And I think that's what the author's note here is alluding to when it says that, I hope that this puzzle was a fun respite from the challenge of the more difficult puzzles in the hunt. And yeah, so for me, it didn't have a lot of like, aha moments. I mean, those are great, but it's also really fun when doing a puzzle just to get through something challenging. You know, when I first opened this puzzle, I had no idea how I was going to go about solving it. I'd never heard of this Muse score program before, and I had no idea how difficult it was going to be to pick up something like this. I just sort of had the mindset of, you know, I'm gonna have to get through this somehow, so I might as well try to pick up as much of this tool as I need. So this, I think, is a case where if I was working on a team, then probably somebody else would handle this one. I mean, reading music and recognizing it in a song is a skill that varies a lot between people, and I'm probably below average on that. And my wife is a composer. If I'd asked her to help with this, we could have probably got it done in a quarter of the time. But, you know, I didn't want to do that in this case. I wanted to show that you don't need a musical background in order to solve something like this. And I think that's actually fairly common when it comes to puzzles like this. There's been a number of times when I've seen something and I thought, oh, somebody with more specialized knowledge of this could probably solve it much faster. I should work on something else. But I stuck with it and learned what I needed to. And it's always a really fun experience, both because I get to learn something new and also the satisfaction of showing that I'm able to apply it to a problem like this. So I encourage you when you're solving these kind of puzzles, don't shy away from trying to pick up a new tool or a new technique uh, just because you think somebody else probably knows it better. For the most part, there's not going to be any puzzles that require like years of training in order to solve. Day three, puzzle three, retinal variants. You look at the next puzzle ball matchup and see a team that looks slightly different than you might expect. Perhaps you should ask the article's author, Dr. Blastoise, for a translation. All right. 18 images of creatures that I assume are Pokemon or based on Pokemon somehow. And huge thing of text. Interesting. No words or anything obvious in here. Seems likely to be a code somehow. 18 strings of text, and each string is maybe a couple hundred letters long, uh, different lengths. But 18 strings, 18 images. This first image looks very similar to the Pokemon Arcanine, but there's a couple minor differences. This one's tail 
is only not only has the uh, flare at the end of it, whereas the Arcanine, the entire tail is fluffy. Uh, and this one has round ears, and this one has pointed ears. And I don't know if that's significant enough of a difference that I should care about it. All right, this M boar has ears, but this one does not. Okay, it seems like they all have a different color from the original Pokemon. That could be a clue out with the title. Retinal variance could mean like color swapping. Hmm. A retinal variance. I wonder if this is a color blindness. Like, may like maybe this is what the Pokemon would look like with a color blindness filter. Oh, that's really cool. Color blindness simulator. So now I can click on the different kinds of color blindness. Red weak protonomaly. Yeah, okay, all right. Green weak, blue weak, tridonomaly. All right, actually, new guess. Color variations is not some transformation of the color palette. I think they just changed it to be more realistic. They gave the goat silver hooves instead of red hooves. And I think that the changes that they made to the anatomy are also to make it more realistic. It's very interesting, but if that's the case, there might not be any more information other than just the Pokemon identification. I should go ahead and finish before I draw any firm conclusions. Okay, so I've got all of the Pokemon images identified. That was a lot harder than I expected it to be for just identifying 18 Pokemon. This might not be a surprise to most people, but there are a lot of Pokemon out there. And some of these are really hard to describe, especially if you don't know what color they originally were. Like, I didn't know what to call this thing. So it definitely helped that they were in alphabetical order. Anyway, my guess is that the variations in coloration and features in each image from the official artwork is not a clue. So based on that, I'm going to switch from this for now to looking at the text. So the text definitely looks very nonsensical. Um, can't really pick out hardly any words. I see that number four here begins with evil. Looks like the lengths of the strings vary between 140 characters and 157 characters. Yeah, look at that. Different length for everything between 140 and 157. But the original order wasn't like alphabetical or anything. So I'm going to put these in order of length and then look at the end. Yeah, you know, I don't see anything other than the fact that, you know, there's one of each length. Let's take a look at the letter frequencies. Okay, so six A's in the first string, zero B's, zero C's, 15 D's, and same for all the other strings. So some letters appear not at all, like J, O, X, U. So B only appears once. Let's put the totals at the bottom. Okay, S appears 266 times. P and L are also more than 200. So we have an unusual letter distribution here. These four letters appear zero times, two appear once, and it jumps up to 35, 41, 60, and then a weird range of numbers after that. So the title of the puzzle is Retinal Variance, and all of the letters in that are pretty high up on this list. That seems like a clue. Oh. Oh, are these amino acids? Yeah, okay, so. This is encoding sequences of amino acids. Notice there's no J, O, U, or Z on this list. I don't remember what puzzle, but I've definitely seen this before in a puzzle. I don't remember biology well enough, but I think these might be like start and stop codons. So that's why they only appear once. Search for Pokemon DNA sequencing and I guess Pokemon is the name of a transcription factor, part of the genome. But if you don't know that out of context, this article seems really weird. Pokemon may offer an effective new target for cancer therapeutics. 
I search for amino acid sequence lookup, this first result is called BLAST, Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. And that's probably what this is referring to in the flavor text, Dr. Blastoise. I submitted one. I, I took the first sequence of 150 characters or so and put it in the search engine, and it's been eight minutes. So while that was running, I also put in a shorter one, just the first 10 characters of that. And it's got some search results after less than a minute. Um, it recognized it was amino acids of length 10. I guess this is all of the different proteins that that amino acid sequence is found in. And so there's 96 matches. So I don't really completely understand this result list, but a lot of them seem to be this Picaturin isoform X1, X2, or X3. And the fact that this starts with Pikachu, which is the name of a Pokemon, makes me think we're on the right track. So like this search result is this protein in, I assume that's camels. This is some other organism, alpaca. But what would be useful if, as I could tell, like if I could map this to some number, like maybe a position within the protein or something like that. So I'm gonna spend a little time trying to make sense of the search results. Okay, so this search of the entire 153 character sequence did eventually finish after like 40 minutes. I went ahead and tried a couple more and they've been finishing much faster since then. So I think it probably will be possible to search for all of these in their complete form. So far, so I've found four of them. And when you put in the entire thing, it rounds it down quite a bit more. I still don't completely understand the search results, but what's always happened is there's always been one on top with 100% identical in the search results. And I don't know what all information I need from here. So far, I've just been writing down this reference sequence number and the name of the gene, which is always Picaturin, and the species that this sequence appears in. Uh, Picaturin, by the way, is a, is a protein that was really named after Pikachu, and it is a retinal protein, which explains half of the title of the puzzle. It, it seems like this is a very common protein found in many vertebrates, it looks like. Okay, so this worked out pretty well. For 16 of the 18, I was able to easily determine which protein it was talking about and which species. And in all of those cases, the species corresponded to one of the images on here. And in some cases, color changes that they had made turned out to be really helpful in matching them up. Yellow-throated sand grouse matched the starly here because, because this animal has, in real life, has a yellow head. Um, there are two that I haven't figured out how to fit yet because the search came back a little weird. Embor, which is a pig, and Exatu, which is an owl. So one of them was this 143 length one. And here's the results for that. So I sorted by this percent identical, and none of them match up 100%. I noticed in all of the cases where the identification was easy, it has a reference number that starts with XP. So I looked into the first one. First one that starts with XP is here. Tango Alba Alba. Burn owl. Okay, great. So I don't know why this didn't match up exactly 100% like almost all the others did, but let's assume that this is the right one. Okay, and that leaves this one, the 151. Here's the results for that. Again, nothing is 100%, but in this case, the top one is an XP. Killer whale. No, this doesn't seem right. I'm hoping for something like a pig. All right, this is the goat. We're getting down to ones we've seen before. Let's just put in boar here for now. I'm pretty sure this is right. Okay, GIT taxon IDs, sort len. So sort len seems like we need to sort by the length. GIT taxon IDs, I think I saw that in here. So there's a field called taxon in the metadata, 9925. Yeah, a letter would have been great, but let's take the number, see what that gives us. The taxon numbers in this database cross-reference are a number between four and six digits, kind of all over the place, a lot of them in the 6,000 to 10,000 range. NCBI tax ID, NCBI GI number. So 9925 is the tax ID for the species. You could also get the genus tax ID, family order, or anything else. Does anybody make this say genus 
taxon ID? I don't think so. We even get taxon IDs, G-E-T. Um, I read about GI numbers. GI numbers identify a gene sequence, the same as what I called reference numbers. So these are called accession numbers. And the GI number is an alternative. I guess this is the older obsolete way to do it, and accession numbers are the newer preferred way to do it. So I found a comment here on a thread from NCBI um, saying how you can construct a URL that will look up the GI number for a accession number. So I can open that link and get a XML response. And the ID number that appears in here is the GI number. All right, so taking the GI number, sorting by the length, does not obviously do anything. All right, I guess I'm stuck, although I feel pretty close. I don't think there's much that I'm missing. There's some ambiguity what uh, taxon ID means, but it really seems to make sense for this to be it. Sort len, I definitely still assume is sorting by the length of the given sequence because that's every number from 140 to 157. It definitely makes sense that you would sort by that. And this GIT at the beginning, that really perplexes me. I don't understand what it could be. Yeah, the GI numbers don't really seem to be useful. I know I have not made progress in a few hours. I don't really feel that stuck. I feel like I could keep going, but it's been eight hours and the solving protocol says if stuck, you must request first hint after eight hours. So I think it's best to stick with this. I've got the hint request here, um, and what this is, is it lists all of the Pokemon that correspond to the animals that this gene sequence comes from. And I ask, is this list completely correct? Having done this, I have a lot of thoughts about this, the hint system and what's best to ask if you have a yes or no question. Like in glistening occasion, I asked, are at least nine out of the 10 correct? Or is this time I'm saying, is everyone correct? I don't really know what's best, but at least for this time, I'm going to try to really confirm something 100% so that I can sort of put it out of my mind the possibility this could be wrong. Let's see. Okay, yes, that list is completely correct. Good luck. Thanks, I'll need it. So I feel like I must be misinterpreting this somehow. These are not all from the same place within the gene. These are pieces of the gene, and they come from all different places within it. They're pretty near the front, but not completely. This gene sequence starts right at the beginning of the gene. This one starts one amino acid, one codon after the beginning, and this one starts 176 codons after. Why didn't they start from the beginning? Maybe there's something else we need to extract from the sequences. I'm particularly thinking like if we could somehow take the taxon ID and map that to an index from 1 to 140 and use that to pick a letter out of this. So certain sequences, of course, appear multiple times because these are all ultimately from the same gene, just different variants of it. So this is what you get if you take the sequences and you stagger them based on where they appear within the gene. That doesn't mean that these should necessarily line up with each other. So the snake, the, um, the pit viper, is incomplete on the amino end, and the coelacanth is incomplete on the carboxy end. So this is the one that's incomplete on the amino end, and it's the shortest one with a length of 140. And this is the one that's incomplete on the carboxy end, and this is the longest one at 157. Huh. So the first one and the last one are incomplete on different ends after you sort them by length, and everything in the middle is complete. Hmm, that could be a coincidence, but it's definitely interesting. I wonder how hard it would be to join these up manually. I can look for um, repeated sequences like this. So these three I can line up pretty easily. But that could just be because these organisms are closely related. Oh, they're all birds. Okay. Yeah, I suspect it's not going to be that easy to get them all. So, it's very interesting. It's cool to try to match these up. But I think this is not going to work, because you look at 12, 13, and 14 here, um, I line them up to match in this section, and you can see they match up pretty well. Um, then I look further down to the right here, 
and I was able to match up these as well. But in order to do that, I had to insert into the middle one, 13 here, some space. So the piece of the gene before this and the piece of the gene after this match up with different places of the gene for number 12 and 14. So it's hard to see how this could produce something useful if the offsets are not unique with respect to each other. All right, here is the second hint I'm requesting. Basically, I included the GI number and the tax ID for each of the sequences. My question is, are either of these useful at all? Am I on the right track here? All right, let's try it. All right, let's see. Yes, ooh, interesting. That's good news. Again, the columns are shared with the NCBI taxon ID and the GI number. So at least one of those is useful. I've obviously looked at this every way I can think of. What could I be missing? Okay, I think I need to give up after all. I was really hopeful that this last hint would get me there, but it's been a couple hours now and still feel no closer. Okay, stop the timer here and write down the fail. Reading the first letters down gives index names by last DI. Oh my gosh. Ugh. Okay. I overlooked something that should have been really obvious really early on, and I miss it the entire time. All right, so before reading the rest of the solution, let's see if we can solve it now. Okay. So to start, all you do is you take the first letter of each of the gene sequences, and that spells index names by last di. And then that, of course, gets combined with the second, what I thought was the first extraction, but is the second extraction. G-I-T now is, uh, completes the word digit. Index names by last digit, taxon IDs, sort len. <sighs> okay. Yes, this is just taking the last digit of the taxon ID column and index names. In two cases here, the taxon ID ends in a zero. So this one's missing. We don't have a taxon ID for this one. Uh, this one, we're not sure about. Except for those two, this is the letters that you get by indexing the Pokemon name by the taxon ID. Oh yes, we need to sort by the length. This would spell victory celebration. Cool. Great. Okay. Retinal Variance by Abigail Karen. Uh, I like this one a lot. I enjoyed a lot of the time I spent solving it. I did not finish it because of a very silly oversight on my part. I'll talk about the puzzle itself first and then I'll go back to takeaways uh, from that mistake. So again, what you're supposed to do is take the first letters of the amino acid sequences and then the first letters of the Pokemon that are closest to the species for each of these sequences. And that, reading the first letters off both of these, gives you the instruction for how to use the taxonomy ID to index into the Pokemon name again, get a different letter out, and then you sort that uh, by the length of the sequence. So whoever got this email requesting a hint must have thought I was really close because it's so obvious looking at this. You just read off the first letter of each of these columns. So I thought the puzzle construction was very well done. It was very impressive, um, and not for the reasons I thought at first. It's cool that you wound up having to extract two different letters from each Pokemon name. I'm really impressed with the artwork. As far as puzzles go, this is really well done. She had to redraw all these Pokemon to make them look more like their real-life counterparts. Uh, a lot of small details, uh, good coloring. This just looks really good. So the main idea behind the puzzle of taking these amino acid sequences, looking them up in, in a real database of gene sequences, um, finding out what organisms they came from, that was really cool. I like that a lot. I remember that it was not hard for me to realize that these were amino acid sequences once I looked at the letter distribution. And I don't know why that is. I'm not very familiar with the topic of amino acid sequences. I think I've seen this in another puzzle before, and that's what it reminded me of. I found two MIT Mystery Hunt puzzles from 2014 and 2016. So I, I didn't actually solve these, so I would say that retinal variance is the first one I've actually tried hard to solve, and I thought it was really fun. I'd never used the BLAST tool before. I didn't really know uh, what it would look like actually using it, and it was very interesting. 
And for this bat gene, it says, this record is predicted by automated computational analysis. This record is derived from another genomic sequence annotated using gene prediction method, NAMON. I had no idea this was possible, that you could predict one protein based on a completely different protein. I guess I don't know exactly what this means, but it sounds pretty cool. And how neat would it be if you could like actually encode a puzzle into a bunch of DNA sequences from different creatures? I think there was actually a Star Trek Next Generation episode about that. I think this puzzle really shows practically uh, what you can do along those lines. Yeah, so great job with this. This is one of my favorite ones so far. Okay, so this puzzle took me way longer than it should have because I missed something that I should really know by now to look for, which is read off the first letter of every item in the list. I don't have any complaints about the puzzle. I was not misled. This is something that I really should have gotten. How did I make this mistake? Uh, what was I thinking instead? How should I have known that the path I was going on was incorrect? And how do I avoid it in the future? So for one thing, the sort of meta-solving I was doing, I had this whole thing with looking at certain ones letter by letter. I think you're very likely to not get anything out of it. There's just so many assumptions that go into these deductions. It's like, oh, well, the puzzle solver needed to do this because they because had to get this answer. But you really have to assume what form the answer is going to take. And it's just so easy to get that wrong. I'm going to try to put a bit less weight on these complicated deductions going forward. But more than that, my problem with this puzzle, it's a problem that every puzzle solver has run into, I'm sure, multiple times. You miss something that you've seen before that you know you should see. It feels like this shouldn't happen after a certain amount of time, you know? Certain things you just shouldn't miss anymore. At the same time, there's never going to be a complete list. The whole point of puzzles is you're never doing the same thing twice exactly. So who knows? I've been keeping a list of specific ways that I have messed up. Uh, this was not on the list, but it's on there now. Does that mean I'm never going to make this exact same mistake again? Who knows? I mean, maybe when the list gets too long, then there's no way for me to cover everything on it. I guess I just wonder if this ever stops. Do the really good puzzle solvers just never have this problem anymore? That's something I look forward to. Day 3, Puzzle 4, X-Ray Fish. Wow. Right. So a five second video clip. The song sounds familiar. I think it's a sample from a well-known song. I want to say it's Rock Lobster by the B-52s. Maybe this lobster here with a guitar is a hint. So first impressions, looks like a bunch of different kinds of fish kind of get hurled across the screen. This one looks like it has a cat face. There's a dog, yeah, so catfish and dogfish. I wonder if these are all like fish puns. This is going to be a bit hard to parse out, but I think that's what we'll need to do. Okay, yeah, this is the song. I know I'm going to have to watch this eventually, so might as well do it now. Dogfish. Catfish. Okay, I couldn't understand most of what the lyrics were, but there was a couple of things I heard that uh, looked like images in the video. In particular, this section at the end of the song. You should definitely look out for these creatures. Okay, this is handy. <laughs> A doge fish. A number of these images show up multiple times, so counting them is probably a good idea, and probably just keeping track of where they appear and when. Doesn't seem like it'll be too bad. This clip's only five seconds long, but it gets pretty chaotic. All right, so there actually is only one catfish, but it traces out such an elaborate route. So it goes from the bottom right the bottom left turns around and starts going right again and shows up in the bottom left and then now it starts moving right again so now it's in the bottom right and now it starts rotating spinning uh, moving to the upper left and then it's moving right again so it moves all over the place and it shrinks and grows and it spins
All these fish identification guides assume that you know something about it, like how big it is or whether it was fresh water or salt water. So I might have trouble with that. All right, that took longer than it felt like, but it wasn't too bad. Looks like we've got 30 fish or, or creatures, if you count a couple weird ones. This weird, I don't know if that's a some kind of gelatin or something. And the, uh, the rock lobster itself. We've got two objects that are clearly not fish. There's this one, which I called a gold nugget, and this one, which I called a potato. And I also made note of two flares that appear near the end. Flare right here, and right here. So, given all that, I think I've written down everything that appears in here. And it seems like everything falls into a category which can be described by one of these with a couple exceptions. Um, so stingray, manta ray, jellyfish, dogfish, catfish, sea robin, piranha, narwhal, whale. All of those appear. And that covers almost everything. So what does that not cover? Uh, the potato and the gold nugget, four red herrings, the gelatin, and the flares. Okay, so everything else. So all of the whales are wearing something. They're not all bikinis. A couple of them are. It's like a Sailor Moon Halloween costume. Okay, so for the ones we know, how they appear in the song. Let's put them in order. Okay, so one obvious thing to try is just index into the category with the number that of which there are. So there's one stingray, so the first letter of stingray is S, one manta ray, so M, three jellyfish, so L, Looking through the lyrics for the other things. So Rock Lobster obviously appears many times in this song. Wondering if this potato could be an earlobe. Or it could be a rock. I guess this food could be jam. Mango jelly. Yeah. It's like the exact same picture, okay. So, jam's the closest thing in the song. So I'm uncertain about a couple of these assignments, but it's pretty close to everything. All right, there's only one vowel on the entire list. There's no way this is right. So I was wondering if we have to reorder these somehow. Best way I could think of, was sort of them by their depth from you know the closest to the farthest or vice versa. And, and, and I think that should be possible. But I was trying to see if you could just get one depth for each category, like all of the sea robins are on one level. But that doesn't seem to be the case because the manta ray, you can see here, passes behind this sea robin. But there's another sea robin that passes behind the manta ray. Yeah, right here. But that just shows you can't assign a single depth to everything in the same category. Oh, it's a jellyfish. Alright, four of these. Just because the puzzle is named X-ray fish after a transparent fish, I thought I might look at the depth more closely. And that issue I saw with the manta ray moving in front of a sea robin. That's the only one that's inconsistent with the rest of its category. As far as I can tell, all of the whales are behind everything else. All of the jellyfish are on the same layer. There's some that are ambiguous, like the narwhals show up at the very end, and so they don't get either in front of or behind most other categories, uh, so we can't narrow it down all the way. It's definitely not just a coincidence that things tend to be on the same layer as each other. Now, that's not necessarily a clue. It could just be that they put them up in order. So I definitely don't want to get too invested in this idea. But it does kind of look more like a word than it did before, especially because potato, who knows what that's supposed to be. I, I highly doubt this is correct. If you can somehow make that an A and put it on top, then this would spell alcohol. And this is very close to rare. You just need to swap the narwhal and the manta ray and they only appear together in like one frame. You can see a narwhal covering the manta ray on the side here. So I listened to this a few times and I never noticed that this is not just the sample from the beginning of the song. There's also some 
animal noises in there. Okay, so that's from the song. Here's from the puzzle. Sounds like fake animal noises, which I think um, might be samples from later in the song. Could let us order them. So we'll have to match up the sequence of animal noises from the song. Actually, it's possible they recorded it on a different track. Let me just download this. All right, so the, the left and right tracks are different. Let's see if we can hear just one. All right, left channel. It's definitely easier to hear. Let's try the right channel. Cool. So it sounds like both of them have both the music and the noises, but it's different ones. So I think what's probably easiest to do is listen to the song, pick out a, a noise, and then try to find it in the puzzle. Wow. Wow. I didn't hear it in there. There it is. Okay, cool. Manta Ray is the last sound effect on the left track. 3.9 seconds in. So I did not hear the stingray noise, but we don't have a stingray category. What I thought was a stingray originally was actually a manta ray, so that's okay. Yeah, okay. That sounds more like a cat. So the structure of the song makes me think that the sound they're making after he says dogfish is the sound of the dogfish, but it could be the one that comes after it, which I think is catfish, which it sounds more like a cat. For now, let's just assume that when he says dogfish, the sound that comes after is the dogfish sound. Yep, okay, great. Watch out for that piranha. Yeah, okay, cool. I think this is everything. We don't have any sound for lobster, and we don't have any sound for red herring. I think that's really fine. The times do seem to be pretty well staggered, so we can put them in order by the time, and they switch back and forth between the left and right track. Man, I was really hoping this would spell something. On Coral. On Corral. If this was On Coral, I would think that's the answer, because it'd be like a pun, like Encore and Coral like the ocean. Can't really get rid of either the narwhal or the piranha. The background is a perfectly static image the whole time. My tendency would be not to submit this as an answer, but I've been doing so badly lately. I know I'll eventually get curious and try it, but I don't try it now. I've been doing really well about not submitting answers before I was sure, so I'll uh, change it up this time. I wanted to try it with corral and coral. Okay, also incorrect. Okay, good to know. You know, if this could be K, this would be OK corral. That should have been a little more obvious to me. We need three whales. So I guess the fact that they're dressed differently, we need to take inventory of the whale's clothing here. Did I miss one? Holy cow, it's one in red. I, I never noticed that before. So if we just ignore the three that are dressed differently, and so now this spells OK Corral. All right, let's try that. All right. Whew. All right, redemption. Cool, let's take a look at the solution. 
Oh, man. Okay, X-Ray Fish by D.D. Liu and Josh Allman. So D.D. Liu did Angry Portals on day one, and Josh Allman did A Glistening Occasion on day two. And in both those cases, both those puzzles, I failed miserably to solve. So if either of them saw me fail their puzzles and got frustrated at it, then hopefully this helps a little bit. So this is by far my favorite solution screen for any puzzle that I've ever seen. Let me talk about the puzzle itself first, and then I want to come back and talk about this a bit. I really love the sense of humor in this puzzle, which is the way that all the fish are arrayed. It's so fast paced and silly. And also the graphic choices. They could have taken a photo of an actual dogfish, but they used you know, this instead. And I like that there was red herring in there as well. That was very clever. So this sense of humor definitely reminds me of Angry Portals. And I think it's really cool when the personality of the puzzle creator comes through somewhat. I mean, not every puzzle has to be so expressive, but it's always a nice touch when it is. As for the construction of the puzzle, you know, I have certain opinions about what makes a puzzle well constructed. For me, I care a lot about uh, it being parsimonious. There not being too much extraneous stuff that is not required to solve. And when you first look at a puzzle like this, you're like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so hard just to figure out what's important in here. And that turned out not to be the case. I thought that despite being so busy and weird, it was fairly straightforward to figure out what I needed to pay attention to. The exact specifics did take me a while to work out, but I wasn't spending a huge amount of time chasing down tiny details. I think a big factor in that is that this was limited to five seconds. It really cuts out the amount of extraneous content. The uh, sound effects overlaid on the song were a really nice touch because they were in alternating audio tracks, but their sounds were staggered, so it was clear what the ordering was. But you could also identify them much more easily by splitting out the audio tracks. And there's one really nice touch, which is that there were four jellyfish, but one of them was a bit hard to identify because it was jelly in the shape of a fish, but it didn't matter because if you take the third letter of jellyfish or the fourth letter of jellyfish, you get the same thing. I thought that was very benevolent. So I know I have a tendency to really examine small details and maybe pursue a lot of dead ends that I really shouldn't. So I think I did a pretty good job here, not falling for anything. The depths of the images was maybe an example of that, but in retrospect, I think that was pretty reasonable. I mean, I looked into it, but then when it seemed like it wasn't going anywhere, I look for something else. All right, so I want to take a minute to acknowledge that a ton of effort went into this solution page. This is, of course, done up like an old personal website from a long time ago, you know, 1978, back when this song was released. This is totally what the web looked like. Lots of silly low-resolution animated GIFs, weird fonts, and, of course, a poorly tiled background that makes the text harder to read than it should be. A hit counter, and of course, the cursor is a lobster, and it leaves behind a bubble trail. I like that there's jokes here, like under Narwhal it says, do the other whales judge them for not wearing clothes? But usually, people who solve the puzzle would have no reason to ever see this page. You just enter the solution, and this page is not usually released until after the hunt is over. That's probably why you know, pe uh, puzzle creators might put a note about some of their thoughts about the puzzle, but it's very rare for them to like add content that just appears on the solution page. So the fact that they went through all this trouble is a really nice touch. Let's listen one more time. Okay, day three, puzzle five. Scramble for the stars. It's nice when your neighbors are superstars. Oh, wow. A bunch of clues and enumerations. And that is it. 88 clues. I see a few things that look like potential patterns in the clues, but I'm not going to worry about that yet. I'm just going to try answering as many of these as I can. They seem to be in alphabetical order, the answers, so should be able to make a good bit of progress here. I've got almost all of them. Missing a few. There's three that have an accent mark on an E, an A, and an I. Seems like there's a lot of X's. Larynxes, Lorax, Lox, Oxtail, Pixar, Roxana, Texaco, XY Plane. And it does seem like there are a lot of words that start with the same letter. We've got eight answers that start with A. 
you know, there's, there's 11 that start with L. So F, none of the words start with F, and in fact there are no Fs in the entire list. No J, although maybe that's not too unusual. Okay, there's no U in any answer. That's unusual. Right, I'm going to get the letter frequency out of this. Okay, so several letters appear zero times. B, F, J, Q, U, V, W, and Z. A scramble makes me think of anagrams, so rearranging the answers somehow. And stars, I was thinking, so stars are named after Greek letters, so like Alpha Centauri, and I was wondering if these would match up to the Greek letters. It doesn't seem like it. You know, there's no Greek letter that starts with F, so I was thinking along those lines, but beta is a very common letter name for stars. Let's see, there's 88 clues, and I think there might be 88 constellations. There's not a single right way to define constellations, but the common, the International Astronomical Union, uh, looks like they use 88 constellations. So that seems like a pretty good matchup. Is there any way that we could correspond each one of these to a different constellation? Aries. Aries the ram. There we go. What if you have to match each of these up with the constellation and then you have to look at what letter is left over? Okay, Andromeda. So this is nine letters, so we need something with eight. So we can sort by the length of the answer. So does one of these look like it close to Andromeda? I think this is not getting me anywhere. I have three K's in the answers and there's no constellation with a K in it. So it's not going to be the case that you can scramble all the letters in the constellation names to get these answers. Some of them do kind of remind me of constellations. It doesn't really seem like enough to be a real pattern. Okay, so there's one answer that has a length of two, nine answers that have a length of three, ten answers that have a length of four. I thought briefly that maybe these could be the answers to a crossword puzzle, and you have to like fit them together in a grid somehow. For standard American crossword rules, you typically can only have even numbers of counts. So like you have to have an even number of four-letter words and even number of five-letter words because they're symmetric. The only exception is if an answer crosses the center square of the grid. So most you can have two that are odd, but we've got four different lengths that are all, that have an odd number of answers. Plus a length of two also by itself doesn't follow the rules. So still don't have any good ideas. It's nice when your neighbors are superstars. So that makes me think either we consider letters that are adjacent to these in the alphabet. So A could go to B, I could go to H or J. Another way to consider neighbors is looking at the stars in the constellation. Like the stars that are connected with this green line could be related to a word somehow, but there's no such thing as like a standard set of lines for constellation. Um, Maybe if there was like some particular source of constellation images that we could use and use those lines, but there's not like a single one as far as I know. When it says your neighbors are superstars, that makes me think that maybe we should consider the second brightest star in the constellation. That doesn't seem to pan out. Alferk, uh, F is one of the letters that doesn't appear. Oh yeah, in general, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the alpha is the brightest star, beta is the second brightest star, gamma is the third brightest star, and so on. Neighbors makes me wonder if we should look at which constellations are adjacent to each other. So like Lepus here is adjacent to Orion, Eridanus, Selim, Columba, Canis Major, Monoceros. Six, three, three, seven, four. It looks almost like the number of adjacent constellations follows a distribution similar to the number of letters in the answers. So like there was one answer with two letters, nine answers with three letters, and it seems like three through eight is pretty typical. So let me see if there's one that has two neighbors and one that has 13 neighbors. That would really seal it. Okay, yeah, Crux has two neighbors, Centaurus and Musca. Hydra is bordered by Libra, Virgo, Corvus, Crater, Sextans, Leo, Cancer, Canis Minor, Monoceros, Puppis, Pyxis, Antlia, and Centaurus. That's 13. Oh, very cool. So what does this mean? 
So if this corresponds to some constellation with seven neighbors, then each of the letters in this would correspond to one of the seven constellations. So I guess the idea is that we need to assign a letter to each constellation such that there's one constellation where its neighbors are assigned these seven letters. I can tell right away that it, it's not going to be as simple as, you know, it's not going to be as simple as like the first letter. Yeah, so like Centaurus and Musca need to be N and I, because the only two letter word is Ni. So I wonder if there's any clue or pattern. Yeah, I wonder if I'm constrained enough that I can just figure out what it is just based on the words I know. I'm going to just try drawing lines between constellations that are our neighbors. We'll see how that goes. It's definitely going to be a bit confusing for the ones on the edge because they wrap around. I assume that diagonals do not count as adjacent. All right, that looks pretty good. I feel like I'm making connections with string on corkboard. I probably missed a few, but I will go through them all now and count the number of connections they have and check them as I go along. So for instance, uh, Lacerda here, I can count along the edges, one, two, three, four, five adjacencies, and I can also count the red lines coming from it. Five, five meshes up, okay, great. Okay. All right, 87 more to go. Once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. It's still a lot of work. All right, is that all of them? All right. So just looking at the numbers of connections for each constellation, let's, it's kind of a pain, but let's, let's write this all down. Yeah. The first stripe is six, five, eight, nine, five, six. Okay, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 87 numbers. So first of all, I'm missing one. There it is. Yeah, I figured it was be one on the edge. All right, let's try this again. Okay, so now the very important test. Let us copy these counts and sort them and then compare them to the length of the answer. Okay, looks pretty good. Two, two. Three, three. So one of the eights should be a nine. One of the sevens should be an eight. Three of the four should be fives. Wait, that can't be right. How can I possibly have an odd number here? I definitely made a mistake. Either not putting the lines or counting the lines wrong. I wonder if there's an easier way to do this part. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, so this one I just miscounted. That's good. So this four should be a five. So that gets our total up from 505 to 506. And we need to get it up to 510. Wait, this one doesn't have a number. Well, there's too many. Hang on. <laughs> what am I double counting here? Serpens is two separate constellations. It's not one constellation, right? Okay. Serpens is unique among the modern constellations being split into two non-contiguous parts. Okay, now everything that was attached to Serpens Cauda, let's instead attach it to Serpens Caput. Oh, and that is going to cause this number to go down by one. So this still has nine connections, this still has three, and this still has nine. But now Serpens, instead of being two constellations with six and four connections, it's going to be a single one with nine. All right, let's try it again. Nice. So if I was not sure that this was the right thing to do before, now I am quite sure. Now the hard part begins to figure out which clue corresponds to which constellation. So these letter frequencies, if one of the constellations is a K and all of its neighbors have to have a K in their answer, then if there are exactly three Ks, that means there has to be exactly one constellation that's K and it has to have three neighbors don't have all the answers, so I can't say for sure, but let's assume for the moment that I got all the Ks. So the answers that have a K are length 6, 
7, and 8. So the question is, is there a constellation number 3 here whose neighbors have values of 6, 7, and 8? Okay, no, there's none. So much for that hypothesis. Ah, but all hope is not lost. What if one of the clues I'm missing has a K? That means that K has four neighbors. Three of them are length six, seven, and eight. Yeah, here we go. Canis Major has neighbors of length five, six, seven, and eight. So we already know a K answer for length six, seven, and eight. That means one of these fives could have a K in it. Link? Yeah, it's not coming to me. All right, let's see what else we got. X might be better. It's got nine, I believe. And if we assume that it's all a single one of size nine, nine, eight, seven, six, 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 five, five, three, six, seven, six, eight, three, six, nine, five, five. Yeah, okay, that's it. So Aquarius is the X. Great. It doesn't tell us what answer corresponds to Aquarius, but we know that all the ones that surround it have to have something with X in it. In particular, there's only one three X, so Aquilius here must be that. There's two fives, three sixes, single seven, Cetus. Yeah, Aquarius is next to Cetus. Single eight, Pegasus. And a single nine. Cool. Delphinus is adjacent to Pegasus, which is larynxes, Equilius, which is lox, and Aquila, which is L and Lomax. It has to be a letter that is in all three of those, which I think must be L. Oh, and that means that Pegasus must be O because Lox is adjacent to L and X, so this must be O. Man, this would be really nice if we just fill in the last couple. I feel like it's going to be slow going at first, but once we get a few, then it'll be easy. All right, I, I like these answers. Liker for active Facebook user and loads for upset saves. So that means this is the fourth one with a K in it. Here we go. Yeah, Canis Major. All right, so this is going to be the K. All right, that means we can get all four of these. Okay, not bad, not bad. These two only share two letters, K and I. And K is here, so this one must be I. So the K and the I are taken, so this has to be L, E, or R. And this one doesn't have any E or an R, so it has to be L. Yeah, so one of these is E and one is R. Drama's word has to contain S, C, Y, O. It needs to be fakes, and it needs to be early in the alphabet. Fakes can be decoys. Yeah, let's go with that. Okay. So Lacerda, Cassiopeia are D and O. And since Academe does not have an O, Cassiopeia has to be a D. I've got a little more than half, I think. I think it's pretty smooth from here on. So. It's smooth, but it's still pretty slow going. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to finish them all tonight, but I'll keep going for a little longer. Okay, that just about does it. I have, with one exception, an answer paired up with each constellation. In each case, the letters of that constellation's green word appear as the purple letters of that constellation's neighbors. Wow, and it's really cool how it all works out. Now, before jumping into the extraction, just take a minute to appreciate this because having it all work out feels really nice. Hmm. Okay, so I have no idea what the extraction is going to look like. I could write down the letters for all of these, 
and sort them in a couple different orders because each of these corresponds to a letter as an addition to a word. So one thing I want to try real quick, just because it seems like an obvious thing to try, is I want to look down the zodiac, see what that spells. Okay. So, well, fortunately the uh, ecliptic is drawn on here, so it should be pretty easy to find the zodiac constellations. This is the direction of motion to the left, so go in order here. Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, E-A-R-T-H-S. All right, this is a good idea. Cool, so that's the extraction reading from right to left, starting with this E here in Aries, which I think is where you usually start this diacal calendar. So most likely the answer I well, I guess is Milky Way, or the Milky Way, or the Milky Way Galaxy, or it could be Earth's Galaxy. I'm okay just checking a couple different ones. Okay, great. Uh, Milky Way is the answer. Okay, Scramble for the Stars by Lewis Chen and John Schneider. Lewis Chen also did the Super Bowl puzzle from day two. I don't think there's too much to say about the solution because it pretty much follows exactly the way we solved it. Yeah, I just want to say this this was a very innovative idea and a very impressive construction, which is always cool to see. I'm not going to go into details of what exactly I mean by that. That would probably take too long, but maybe I'll make a video about that at some point. One reason I feel qualified to say that this is impressive is because this is a problem that I've spent some time thinking about, treating the celestial sphere as a surface and thinking about mazes or games or problems you could set on that surface. I have this uh, Twitter account where I used to tweet problems that would come to my head, and here's one about adjacent constellations. So having thought about problems like this a bit, it's hard to say why, but for some reason the celestial sphere just seems harder to set problems on than, say, the surface of the Earth. It's almost as if it, like there's no features on it. So like there's stars, of course, but for whatever reason that just doesn't seem like enough. Uh, like I said, that the connections, the lines connecting the stars and constellations, there's no like standard for that, so you can't use that. In this puzzle, I realized as soon as I was done the one good thing to try would be reading off along the ecliptic. And I think that's just because there's really not much else you can do. So I think using adjacent constellations was a really good idea, and the way they used it was really good. So I'm impressed that they made it work. You know, despite all the time I've spent thinking about this, I didn't even know that Serpens was non-contiguous. So I studied astronomy for 10 years, and I can't pronounce half of these constellations. But that's okay, I think that's pretty typical for astronomers. Solving this was really cool. It really felt like the puzzle involved the 3D nature of the celestial sphere. You know, the way you have to keep in mind that near the poles, like these constellations that seem very spread out are actually almost adjacent. So the deductions in one affect the other one. You know, things that wrap around the edge are closer than they look on the drawing. So it was kind of mind-bending, kind of like a very fun logic puzzle on day two. So I thought they made really good use of the natural structure. So looking at the solve rate, this had 40 solves, and it is the lowest solve rate of any puzzle so far up to day three. I didn't get stuck for very long at any point, but this was definitely a hard puzzle. It took me nine hour, over nine hours to solve, and I wonder if most of the people who did not solve it just weren't stuck like me and they took a long time and they just didn't get to finishing it, or if they were stuck at some point. Regardless, even if you don't get stuck, this puzzle is a difficult solve. I think the way I would say the reason behind that is that you have to make these solid logical deductions based on uncertain solves. Like, for instance, it says here, this deduction is based on the fact that C only appears in four answers and they have lengths of five, six, six, and seven. Well, that's true, but you don't know that unless you have solved all those. So if you've got your list of answers, but you're missing five of them, and five of them you're unsure of, and two of them are wrong, you don't even know it, it makes making the deductions much harder. You can make deductions with a certain amount of certainty, but the way that this puzzle worked out, you'd have to make a few deductions chained together, and if each one of them is uncertain, it becomes worse, and the, the uncertainties really add up. I don't know if they intended it for it to be this hard, to have like the lowest solve rate of the first three days. You know, maybe so. Maybe they really wanted to end day three with a really hard one. But I thought about, a little bit about how you could potentially make this easier. And maybe they considered this, but they, they liked it better how it was. But my idea was to include a letter bank. So these are the number of A's in all of the answers put together. And so if you just put this list of numbers at the bottom of the puzzle, 
Uh, you don't have to say A is 77, B is zero. That's gonna be pretty obvious from the fact that there's 26 numbers. And the fact that these add up to 510 and the enumerations add up to 510, I think people would figure out pretty quickly what it is, whether you told them or not. But, but that would really take you from having the clue solved 95% to having them solved 100%. If you could see, oh, I'm still missing a C because I've only got three Cs. And that would have made a big difference in a couple of places when it can, comes to actually filling in the answers on the constellations. So this does make the first part of the puzzle, the answers here, a bit easier, maybe too easy. But for me, that's okay. Anyway, just my opinion. This was a fun solve and a puzzle set on the celestial sphere, something I've always wanted to see, and I'm really glad that somebody's done it, and I'm really glad that they did it so well. That was great, and a great way to end day three. Okay, so that was day three. The puzzles are definitely getting harder based on the solve rates, as well as on my own solve rate and solve times. I feel like I'm learning about the process, like how to make an interesting video from me failing for 12 hours to solve a puzzle. I don't know that I'm there yet, but it's good practice. I'd say I'm also getting some thoughts about you know, various things like the hint system in particular. I'll probably save the details for a longer video at some point, but basically there's a lot of different ways that you can give hints in a puzzle hunt like this, and the yes-no system that they use here definitely has some advantages uh, in that it forces you to really make sure you're asking questions carefully. But I'd say the big disadvantage is that it really does not give you that much information in all three of the three cases where I used hints. In no case did it get me unstuck. So I don't know if that's just me not using them very effectively, but like I said, that's a big topic, so I'll cover it another time. So there are three more days left for a total of six days in this puzzle hunt. So I do plan to get to the last three days at some point, but I don't know exactly when. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching.